We have Trey Gowdy, who until uh, not long ago served uh, as the uh, member of Congress representing the 4th District of South Carolina, but has returned to private practice. So welcome back to the legal profession. We're happy to have you, and thank you for uh, joining us for the panel. He's now at Nelson Mullen. And we have Hank Asbell, who I've known for a number of years, uh, who is uh, renowned as a legend in the white collar bar and also known to many of you. Um, Hank has had a very distinguished career and continues to practice at the highest levels of the profession. He's had more than 100 trials, which I was telling him yesterday. I don't know if there's another defense attorney uh, who has never been a prosecutor who can claim that number of, uh, of trials under his belt. So um, he's got a lot of uh, experience that um, he's going to share with us relating to the issues we'll talk about today. And then lastly, we have Brian Rafferty, who until very recently uh, served as the chief of the criminal division in the Southern District of Georgia and uh, got a shout out from the U.S. Attorney earlier today for his great work in that position. Um, Brian has also recently uh, rejoined private practice uh, and is now at Pulsinelli. So uh, I thought maybe, Brian, since you were at DOJ most recently and uh, including when the Yates memo was actually issued and implemented, uh, that you might be able to set the stage for us by talking about the background, why it was uh, issued and uh, how it was implemented uh, in the first several years. Sure. So uh, I think the department has been criticized or was being criticized going back to 2008 uh, for not prosecuting enough individuals in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, that criticism continued to 2010, where a lot of judges then started criticizing the department when they would put forth settlements um, from the SEC and other government entities in which they were companies were paying large sums of money and no individuals were being prosecuted. And now that I'm on the defense side, I can say, as is so often the case with the department, uh, we were on one side of the pendulum and the department goes all the way to the other side of the pendulum by issuing the Yates memo, uh, which I know everybody in this audience is, is familiar with, but which essentially requires, an, it's an all or nothing approach where corporations um, you know, were, were required to uh, disclose all relevant facts about all employees involved in the alleged misconduct to get any credit for cooperating in the, in the context of an investigation. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, I've been on these panels before. Joe Whitley has invited me up here for a healthcare fraud panel just about every year for the last five years, uh, where I talked as the criminal chief for the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I echoed many of the comments that we heard earlier today from the United States attorneys about what the Yates memo meant. That is to say that, you know, prosecutors always want to prosecute individuals. Uh, we always look to individuals to prosecute. And so for the U.S. attorneys, and AUSAs, the Yates memo in some ways was much ado about nothing. And, and that's a lot of what we heard today from, from the United States attorneys. Uh, and that's true. I mean, there have been policy memos in place within the department going back to the 1999 or so, uh, where individual prosecutions has always been a point of emphasis. Uh, but I think the distinction, the, the difference, the different perspective I have now, uh, perhaps now that I'm on the defense side, is it's how you get there to prosecute those individuals. And that's sort of where maybe I didn't really understand the question when it was asked of me as a prosecutor, and I'm not sure that the U.S. attorneys really addressed it from this perspective, because the Yates memo, I think, um, changed uh, the scope of things in that in order for corporations to really get the full benefit of cooperating, um, they essentially had to throw all their employees potentially under the bus. Um, and they, they put that in writing. The department put that in writing. And I think that's where uh, the trouble starts. And Hank, do you want to chime in? How have you seen the uh, memo implemented, and what, what's your take on what the impact has been? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if it, uh, if it changed uh, uh, the policies of particular uh, individual U.S. attorney's offices. I'm sure that some it has and some it hasn't, and some have continued to do what they've always done, and some have uh, taken this guidance, the VH memo, to heart, basically. But I think the practical consequence uh, of the Yates memo uh, has been to incentivize corporations, much more than they have been in the past, uh, to go into full cooperation and compliance mode from the beginning. And that means, you know, hiring outside counsel, it means conducting internal investigations, getting documents, interviewing witnesses, et cetera, and giving all the uh, information you can uh, to the government. And it has turned, in my view, or at least from the defense perspective, uh, lawyers for companies uh, and companies themselves into unofficial prosecutors uh, who are effectively and, and basically the government has outsourced their investigation uh, to third parties in exchange for GPAs and non-GPAs. 
And, and I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, I think that, you know, the department will often roll out numbers uh, in, in the wake of Yates and, and other memos like it where they will talk about uh, increased prosecutions, increased settle, civil settlements of individuals uh, as evidence that um, the Yates memo and memos like it worked. Um, and, and I, you know, and I was certainly a part of those kinds of discussions myself. Um, but numbers are always easy to manipulate. Everybody kind of knows that. And I think it can be said that I don't know that the additional civil settlements and the additional criminal individual prosecutions that have flowed since Yates are really a function of Yates at all. Um, I think a lot of that could be attributed to the fact that there's good cases out there and that they're prosecuting individuals. I also think it could be said that, you know, additional resources have been dedicated uh, to various agencies within the Department of Justice that might justify additional prosecutions. Uh, I think just last year, in 2018, they announced the largest rollout of more prosecutors. The budget for the department has gone up. And uh, so the increased prosecutions could as much be a product of those types of things as it is the Yates memo. And, and you know, my own view, and I've heard other people say it is, um, the greatest beneficiary, I think, of the Yates memo have been individual lawyers. Um, you know, lawyers are now getting retained more frequently to represent individuals in all of these investigations, as Hank has said. And so we as lawyers have certainly benefited greatly in some ways. Uh, but the individual employees, you know, have obviously suffered. Well, we can all be happy about that impact. <laughs> um, Trey, I know you've been in touch with uh, some of the senior leadership at DOJ, and uh, this administration took a slightly different uh, position on the Yates memo, and Rod Rosenstein, before he left his position as the Deputy Attorney General, uh, announced that they were dialing it back in very nuanced, minor ways. But um, what's your uh, understanding of this administration's position and whether they're going to make any more significant changes uh, to their approach to these issues? Well, I, I guess I was there Tuesday. I want to stress I was there not in my individual capacity, not my, in trouble with the department. <laughs> want, given what I used to do for a living, I want to be very clear about that. Um, and I just took, at the end of our meeting, I just said, I, I need you to help me understand this sentence. All relevant facts relating to individuals responsible for misconduct. Because all is a big word, relevance is a big word, and misconduct is a big word. Um, and they immediately pivoted uh, to, to what Rod had said. So I went and found exactly what Rod said. And I think the, the new memo is uh, all means uh, really important. Uh, relevant means um, relevant and material. And misconduct is constricted to criminality. Uh, you know, the word misconduct is broader than criminality. But if you look at Rod's comments, he mentioned criminality three times. He also said two other things I think are worth noting, uh, because I think it has a, a perverse effect. If he was trying to lessen the Yates memo, which I think is what he was trying to do, substantially involved or responsible, significant roles, and then we want to know who authorized the misconduct. All right, so if Sally said just the facts, and you've got Rod saying substantially involved or responsible, significant roles, and authorized the misconduct, those are not facts. Those are conclusions. Those are observations. So if the burden is now to turn over observations and not just facts, then the perverse impact would be, I think, um, that it's even more difficult for practitioners to follow what Rod said than it was Sally Smith. The interesting thing about, I think, Rod's comments when he gave them in late 2018, I think everybody in the department and outside the department assumed with the new administration that there might be a different perspective brought to bear, uh, a more corporate friendly uh, administration. Perhaps they would just get rid of the Yates memo altogether. Um, but ultimately, I, I think that you know, really all Rod Rosenstein's comments uh, come out to mean is we don't need you to throw every single employee under the bus, just the most significantly involved employees under the bus if you want to get cooperation credit. So I'm not sure really it changed much. Well, it's targeted, targeting C-suite people in addition to mid-level managers. I mean, obviously they're looking, the department is looking to prosecute the higher ups in the corporation that might either condone or authorize or somehow uh, foster whatever the misconduct may be. I think that's a good segue to tie in uh, the other topic we promised to talk about, which is Upjohn warnings and whether that practice is changing or should change in light of these policies. And because we're uh, giving you all CLE credit, I'm going to actually read from a rule from the ABA Rules of Professional Responsibility so you can actually earn the credit. Uh, 
And it's a relatively short rule, but I think it does uh, highlight exactly what Trey and Hank were just talking about. Um, rule 1.13F says that in dealing with an organization's directors, officers, employees, members, shareholders, or other constituents, and usually we're talking about uh, officers or employees, uh, a lawyer shall explain the identity of the client when the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the organization's interests are adverse to those of the constituents with whom the lawyer is dealing. So when the company is under this very explicit directive to make sure that it provides all relevant information about an employee's misconduct, and then company counsel interviews that employee, it seems to me, at least under that rule, that the interests are already adverse even before the company really knows whether those interests whether what the employee would say or what the employee's uh, potential misconduct might be. I don't know, Hank, is that your take or what would you say on uh, on this rule and how that should be applied uh, as we practice and advise companies and employees? Well, it's always been my personal practice even before the Yates memo to go further than Upjohn required uh, in terms of advising uh, people that I talked to within a corporation if I was representing the corporation uh, to, make, I mean, to make it very clear to them that not only do I not, I represent the corporation, I don't represent them, uh, and you should assume that we are highly likely, if we haven't already cut a deal, you should assume that we are highly likely uh, to gather information and give it to government agencies that are, you know, in our discretion, basically, and you should know that going into this interview. Uh, and I think that's the only fair thing to do. Uh, after the Yates memo, I think it's even more significant that the Upjohn warnings be expanded, and you make it very clear, not only that that's the drill that's going to occur, but who you represent. Uh, if you get to the worst case scenarios, it's not like the Conley case, I know we're gonna talk about later in this panel, uh, where the government is micromanaging uh, the internal investigation. Uh, you know, maybe the, maybe the warning ought to be, I represent the company and DOJ and the CFTC <laughs> and the SEC. So you ought to know that from me right up front because that's the truth of what's happening here. Yeah. The trade drew our attention to an article uh, recently, a very good article on, uh, on the Yates memo and its implications uh, that discuss exactly that, just should the Upjohn warning be strengthened and stronger than it generally is in its current form, uh, including should, the, uh, should counsel advise the employee that not only uh, you know, could the company choose to waive privilege uh, if the company decided to waive, but has the company already in fact waived the privilege such that uh, the employee should not expect there to be any, uh, any privilege? Have, have you all seen that or ha have any of you changed the way that you uh, issue these warnings in light of these developments? Well, I've said how I, yeah, yeah, how I would issue the warning. I've, yeah. I've described it basically. Yeah. That's that's uh, I think that's historically been my practice, but even more so after the Yates memo came yeah. out, because I think it's a foregone conclusion that other than for a private company, uh, perhaps, uh, or you know, if you're if you're representing a public company or any company uh, and that has shareholders, obviously, particularly if it's in a regulated industry, mm -hmm. they're going to cooperate. Period. Yeah. That's all they're going to do, you know, yeah. and, the, and the Yates memo gives a high incentive to do that. Yeah. Uh, it's almost inevitable that that's going to occur. Yeah. Uh, and I think you should be straight with the employees that you're talking to, uh, yeah. not only about who you represent, but who you don't represent. Yeah. Uh, and it's them. I, I agree with you 100%. I just want to point out one little caveat that has me a little bit concerned. Sally mentioned within the bounds of law and legal privileges. Mm -hmm. So if enhanced Upjohn warnings aren't required and you give them, are you signaling to the employee, we really don't want you to talk and therefore is that not an existing privilege and you're gonna get dinged when it comes cooperation time because you over Mirandize someone? Well, this is a good point, and I'd be interested, uh, Brian, in hearing your thoughts on whether you think DOJ is sympathetic to that kind of dynamic when the employees might get spooked by these enhanced Upjohn warnings. And it's not been my experience that they are, but uh, it's certainly possible. I think in words, I think they would be sympathetic, yeah. but I think in practice, they probably would not be. Yeah. Uh, I think they are very interested. I think at the outset, they typically have an idea of who they're most interested in individually, and so they want to hear what those individuals have to say. Um, they are gonna say as a matter of policy, they're not gonna direct these investigations, uh, but they sort of 
in order for the corporation to get that credit, they want the corporation to do whatever it can to get the information to the government. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think that those sorts of enhanced warnings, target warnings have been suggested. I know in the, in the law review article and other articles mm -hmm. that are out there, it's been suggested that in, in the course of a internal investigation, target warnings just like we give in the Department of Justice uh, should be given in internal investigations if the, if the uh, company has an idea that, that an individual is, has engaged in illegal conduct and they're going to interview them. Uh, you know, and oftentimes these folks are interviewed uh, fearing for their jobs. They know they'll get fired if they don't cooperate. And so they really don't have a meaningful choice. Uh, and if the government has already sort of indicated to the company counsel um, that this person may have engaged in some illegal conduct, I mean, I think target warnings are appropriate. I don't know if they're required under the rules of ethics, but I think at a matter of fairness, they should be given because these folks don't really appreciate, um, and the Connolly case is a good example of that, uh, where they are. We've now mentioned the Connolly case twice. Brian, why don't you go ahead and explain to those who haven't read that or are not familiar with it what the Connolly case, uh, which came out of the Southern District of New York, what, what, the, uh, what that decision uh, was and said. Sure. So, so the, the, the case is out of the Southern District of New York before Judge McMahon. It was a district court opinion. If anybody wants to find it, um, it was just decided in, I think, May of this year, it's CR 370. Uh, 116 CR 370, and the document decision is uh, document 432. Uh, essentially, that case involved uh, an investigation that began with the CFTC back in 2008. The CFTC essentially sent a letter to Deutsche Bank asking them to conduct an investigation and told them exactly what they were interested in. And so Deutsche Bank at the time uh, was, I think, in some trouble, and so it conducted an investigation, hired a very prominent and, and uh, very uh, well thought of outside law firm to conduct this investigation, but the investigation was essentially run by the Department of Justice. Uh, the case was prosecuted by the Antitrust Division in the Frost Fraud Section, and um, so Deutsche Bank did an investigation th through 2015 where they interviewed a lot of employees, but virtually every step that they took during the course of the investigation was directed um, by the department, the lawyers, and the investigators. Who to interview, when to interview, what questions to ask, there were weekly calls, um, and ultimately, uh, the company settled uh, and got a uh, DPA for three years and paid $775 million, didn't get convicted, and two individuals associated with uh, the entity uh, were prosecuted. There's a guy named Connolly and there's a guy named Black who ultimately went to trial. And Black had been interviewed three times during the course of the investigation by uh, corporate counsel. He was given the traditional upshot warnings and nothing more. He didn't have a lawyer. Uh, he was going to get fired if he didn't agree to be questioned. The, the department directed a lot of things about the uh, interviews of, of Mr. Black, and, and he was interviewed three times and ultimately gets indicted and gets convicted. Um, during the course of the trial and then post-trial, there were a number of motions based on Castigar uh, in which the defense attorney suggested that the interviews and the investigation by the outside law firm were, for all intents and purposes, a government investigation. Uh, and, you know, the, everything they did was being driven by uh, what the government wanted. And Judge McMahon ultimately found that it was, in fact, state action. Uh, and so, as a consequence, they went to the, they never really got to the, cancer, the Castigar analysis because the government didn't use the statements that Mr. Black had given in connection with any aspect of the investigation, didn't introduce them during the trial. But the decision is worth a read because of how Judge McMahon blasted the government and the way in which they conducted this investigation, uh, and it leads to some of the concerns that we've already talked about. Well, let me follow up on yeah, that. Uh, I mean, the case, the facts of the case are, are, are truly outrageous and, and sort of fascinating, but um, the CFTC asked Deutsche Bank to conduct a voluntary investigation. The Paul Weiss partner who was in charge of the external investigation testified there was nothing remotely voluntary about it. Uh, so the court finds that the outside counsel cooperated extensively with the DOJ, CFTC, SEC, talks to them on a weekly basis to keep them abreast of what's going on, and gets directions from the government on a weekly basis about what to do, who to talk to, and how to do it. Uh, the government gets weekly status reports. Uh, there are 230 phone calls, 30 in-person meetings between the government agents and the outside counsel. Uh, Deutsche Bank flags key documents, et cetera, for the government. Uh, and Paul Weiss gives the government a readout of their interviews, uh, and they're asked to go back and ask additional questions uh, that the government 
uh, constructs basically to the employees, dig in more, uh, et cetera, follow up, and do it, quote, as if you were a prosecutor. That's the instruction. Uh, you know, the employees, of course, uh, you know, don't have the uh, uh, discretion not to talk to the investigative team because they're told they're gonna be fired if you do not. Uh, and that creates the Garrity problem because the government essentially, and Paul Weitz is the government in that context, according to the judge, uh, they're the state actor here. Uh, and, you know, they, the government then discusses all these interviews in real time with the lawyers, et cetera. Uh, and the government never interviewed any of these witnesses itself until several years after the start of the investigation. Uh, so in any, in any event, basically the court says, Paul Weitz did everything the government could, should, and would have done had the government done its own work. Uh, and, you know, the government never claimed it was engaging in a parallel investigation. It just simply piggybacked off what Deutsche Bank did. Uh, but obviously the judge comes out, no harm, no foul. She trashes the government and says that basically, you know, if I found a Castigar violation, I would have dismissed this prosecution. So that would be the consequence uh, of, uh, you know, ultimately the consequence basically of had there not, had there uh, been a Castigar violation, but interestingly, the judge does not trash the lawyers from Paul Weitz. And I couldn't quite figure that out until I understood that she was an alum of Paul Weitz. Uh, and so, you know, what a surprise uh, that there's no trashing of that. But for the, I have serious ethical problems with the lawyers doing this work in the way that was described in the opinion and not being more candid with the employees that they were investigating. I don't, you know, there is an obvious ethical rule, basically. You tell people who you represent if you're a lawyer and who you do not represent. And it's, it's clear to me, I mean, they represented the government in this case. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I'm sure they didn't give any expanded Miranda warnings to Gavin Black or anybody else they interviewed. Yeah. Now, the court's description of what the government did in that case does sound to me like the fraud section's uh, manner of investigating in certain cases that I've been involved in. I don't see the U.S. Attorney's offices as frequently taking that kind of very aggressive approach with companies, but Brian, I'd be interested in, in your experience, or Trey, if you have any thoughts you know, on, on those comments. Fr from my experience, you know, this was not the way in which we conducted yeah. business in the U.S. Attorney's Office. I think it wasn't the way it was done when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Northern District of Georgia either. Uh, I think it's of note that it was a it was a fraud section um, led investigation with assistance from the antitrust division. Uh, I'm proud to say that in the 10 or 11 years I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I avoided having anything to do with the fraud section. Um, <laughs> my whole office's philosophy, McAvoy can testify to this, is to try as much as we can to avoid having nothing to do with uh, Washington or any any <laughs> section within the department there, because. In my own experience, they tend to, to muck things up a little bit. Um, I will say, you know, th this opinion um, ha has been the subject of a lot of online discussions. You can find a lot of articles, a lot of pieces have been uh, issued by a lot of different law firms. Um, one that I thought was of interest is David Zinn from Williams and Connolly um, had an opportunity to interview Rob Zink. Uh, in Washington, D.C. in late May, shortly after. And Rob Zink was the acting chief of fraud at the time, is that? Yeah. He is now, I think, going to be the head of fraud, and he also was a signatory on the government's mm -hmm. brief, I think, the government's brief in response on this black issue. Um, and he was interviewed about this, and he was asked a lot of very difficult questions by David Zinn, and you can imagine how difficult it was to answer some of those questions. And, you know, the, the steady, um, answers, I think, is it's the government's policy. We don't make the companies do what we want them to do. Companies control their own investigations. Um, but obviously, I think the situation, as, as, as Hank has described it, um, suggests maybe sometimes otherwise. Yeah, here's, a, yeah, yeah, here's what Zink says, and it's quoted in this uh, Law 360 article. Um, in order for there to be a Fifth Amendment violation, a Garrity violation needs to be state action. We've done our best to make sure that we do not in any form or fashion direct the company's investigation. However, he adds that the difficulty comes in international cases uh, because we can't easily dispatch agents uh, inter to interview overseas witnesses, et cetera. So there's a carve out in his view, apparently, uh, if you've got an international component to the case that uh, maybe we can direct it uh, uh, more than we would uh, in the United States. Uh, and so he gets pressed 
uh, on how, how are companies supposed to be expected to secure information uh, from employee witnesses when the company is cooperating with DOJ. And Zen asks, uh, if, you don't, if we don't fire an employee who fails to cooperate, uh, assuming the DOJ is unable to get the employee to talk otherwise, would DOJ consider that a good faith effort uh, on the part of the company to obtain and turn over all relevant information? What's the answer from Zinc? That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I don't, I don't really have an answer what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do uh, with that in terms of it, uh, whether that's good faith or not. Uh, and Zinc adds that it's up to the companies to decide whether to fire and discipline employees, but if, you, if they have a clearly articulated policy that threatens to fire people who don't cooperate in an investigation, uh, and the company then chooses not to fire a particular uh, recalcitrant employee who doesn't want to talk uh, because they're worried about their own exposure, et cetera, or being brought up into, into or tied up into something that, uh, that might make them exposed, then DOJ is going to take that into consideration when evaluating the company's uh, uh, you know, cooperation efforts, et cetera. Uh, and so anyway, that, that, the, then it goes on, well, you know, if we quickly, if we, the company, quickly individual and the outside lawyers quickly interview people um, about things that happened years before, and we don't give them access to materials, they don't have, uh, they don't have their emails, they don't have their documents, they don't have their calendars, they don't have any other uh, access to information that might refresh their recollection and make their uh, statements more accurate, uh, et cetera, then, you know, uh, and they've got to quickly, and they get jumped on by outside counsel, basically. Um, you know, it's a real dilemma, obviously, for defense counsel, uh, which Zen, I mean, which uh, Zink agrees with. It is a real dilemma. Uh, but it also creates problems for the government, uh, because now you may have, uh, you may have information that, uh, you know, from a potential witness or whatever, who's going to have to backtrack and explain that if they've become a cooperating witness for the government about why they got it wrong when they were first uh, interview. Uh, so, you know, that's the, the scenario. The other thing that strikes me about all this is if, if the more the council, the outside council is acting for the government or at the government's direction, um, are they subject to Brady demand? Uh, why, why wouldn't I subpoena, uh, you know, out, or, uh, you know, ask or demand that, uh, ask and get a court to enforce it, ask, ask outside counsel basically to review all its documents, all its records, uh, and to give me any Brady information because really they were acting as government agents uh, at that time. And I think to the extent you can make that connection factually, uh, it opens them up to that liability. And there was another great example of this in California recently in a case that uh, John Tecker tried, the uh, autonomy case, uh, U.S. versus Sushivan Hussein. Uh, and they filed a motion. They didn't, it didn't get any traction, but the motion basically was uh, defendant's notice of motion directing the government to review the files of Hewlett Packard and Morgan Lewis, uh, basically, and turn over under Kyle's uh, versus Whitley um, any exculpatory information in the attorney's files uh, because they were acting on the government's behalf. Uh, so that's a real risk. Here. And I think it's something that ought to be exploited by the defense counsel. Wouldn't that extend to Rule 16, though? Beg your pardon? Wouldn't it also extend to Rule 16? Yeah. I mean, they're part of the government team. Yeah. No, I think, I think they are. Under Kyle's, I think they're part of the government's team, basically. Uh, and in particular, because uh, Hewlett Packard basically had, had signed a confidential settlement agreement uh, that required them to cooperate with the government and to do a lot of these types of things. Yeah. Um, and in the face of that, basically, the defense was arguing that. Uh, that clearly Kyle's applied, uh, and HP had, uh, Hewlett had every incentive to withhold the material because it also was pursuing a $5 billion civil lawsuit against Mr. Hussein in England. Uh -huh. So, um, I mean, these are, you know, I mean, there are dangers in terms of doing this, uh, you know, all the way around, and, uh, but I think that that's something that you ought to look at carefully if you see this kind of connection or this interaction between government counsel and company counsel that seems unholy. Uh, and if you get into that more, I think you can make these challenges and hopefully they'll get some traction to some judge somewhere. Yeah, Trey, I, mean, I, Trey, I see you trying to interject here. What's your take? <laughs> well, I don't want to defend the department, not where I'm sitting right 
now, but I mean, the facts were egregious in Connolly, but apparently they were not egregious enough to, to result in any sanction whatsoever mm -hmm. other than a really stern lecture. So if you are being directed to provide all relevant facts, mm -hmm. who gets to decide what's relevant? Mm -hmm. I assume it's the government. Mm -hmm. So can you ask the government, what do you consider to be relevant? Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly you can't say, interview the following people in the following order and ask the following question. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it sounds but, like but what that, can you do? Yeah. I mean, what, how much interaction can you have with the government to qualify for cooperation credit do you just go with what you know now? Is there a duty to investigate? So I, what does it mean to cooperate and, and who determines relevance? I, I think the answer, I think you can ask the government those questions and the government will hopefully give you that information, right? But I think when they start giving you that information, you're now taking the direction. You're, you're learning about the government's theory. You're learning about who they're interested in, which I think then leads you to need to give enhanced upjohn warnings because you know who is potentially facing some criminal liability here. You will have an idea. And so when you talk to those folks, in addition to just giving them the standard upshot warnings, I think you need to give them a little bit more. Which, which raises this question. Was, was the misconduct in Conley the failure to give the enhanced warnings, or was it this, uh, this symbiotic relationship between the government and outside counsel? The latter. So it... Yeah, no, it was the symbiotic relationship. So it they could not have been cured by an enhanced set of, of warnings. Well, I don't know if it could have been cured if those had been given to begin with, but they were not. Uh, so, I mean, nobody gave those enhanced warnings. They just gave standard upjohn warnings to people that they interviewed. Uh, and if, then if you couple that with, you know, the government's direction or micromanagement of the investigation, you know, that's where the, uh, the, question, the problem arises. If they had given uh, more uh, uh, fulsome, uh, up John mornings to begin with, or uh, would that have, have altered the judge's view of the case? Um, I'm not sure, depending on how it turned out factually. Uh, I guess another scenario that's possible is uh, and, and to get away from a particular case where you might have a problem with the government if you are giving more uh, fulsome warnings. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether anybody's considered it or not, but what about a compliance program internally within a corporation where you educate all of the employees about the Yates memo, and in general, how government investigations mm -hmm. are going to work, mm -hmm. uh, and give that advanced information to mm -hmm. you know all your relevant employees from the start yeah. before there is ever yeah. any problem or ever any investigation. You, you want to think that you don't have to tell your employees when they take the job that hey, be careful not to commit any crimes. <laughs> no, no, be careful not to commit any crimes, but but you may get you you know if there is an internal investigation. This is the this drill. Is this is say. the landscape. Right. This is the incentive right. for the company, et cetera, right. to cooperate, and that's what's going to likely happen. And you know, you ought to know that going yeah. into it. Whether you're told by the outside lawyers or not, you ought to know that this yeah. is the scenario. And then presumably people are going to say, uh, do I need counsel? Mm -hmm. uh, and my response is, your question answers itself. Mm -hmm. Well, the way I read Rod Rosenstein's yeah. remarks is uh, similar, Trey, to what your take was, which is that he's encouraging a dialogue like we don't want you to uh you know go to the ends of the earth and uncover every single fact you know all relevant facts doesn't really mean all relevant facts to your uh description he wants a dialogue he says let's talk about what's really important and if you give us what's really important that's going to earn you cooperation so th that to me falls well short of the uh what the judge described in the Connolly case, which is DOJ specifically directing every step of the investigation and really controlling what the company uh, counsel are doing, which I think that seems to me what offended her. And I didn't see that to be what Rod uh, was trying to convey in his uh, yeah, he specifically policy. He specifically says it should not be delayed uh, mm -hmm. unless you are pursuing, and again, whatever mm -hmm. the word substantial means, mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I'm trying to, to figure out was the misconduct in Connolly that the government directed the investigation or was the misconduct that the private firm did not administer enhanced upjohn warnings? I mean, surely there's a limit to how much the government can accomplish through a non-governmental entity. Surely there's a limit. Um, but it seemed like Brian was suggesting, maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but but enhanced upjohn warnings may have cured some of what happened in those facts. Well, I, I, I guess I think that in, in, in 
other corporate investigations, I think that enhance of John Mornings uh, are necessary because regardless of the softening of, of what the Yates memo was through Rosenstein's comments, I still think that companies are being essentially told that they have to throw people under the bus and therefore I think you need those enhanced warnings. I think in this, in this Connolly case, I agree with Hank, which is I think the entire investigation, this was at the extremes, but it also represents what can happen in a desire to prosecute individuals and we're supposed to go after individuals. It, it represents, I think, as an example of what can happen when these investigations go too far. The government doesn't want to spend all the money on the investigations. They may not have the agents that really want to invest in these long-term complex fraud investigations, but you got these, uh, these big companies with a lot of money, with a lot of lawyers who you can deputize and say, you go do and find these things and come back and bring this to me and tell me who's involved and all this other stuff. And that, that is the extreme of what you saw in Connolly, but I just think it's a cautionary case of yeah. what can happen. What's interesting to me about the Connolly case, the, the last job that I had uh, with the Department of Justice was as the attache at the U.S. Embassy in London, and I was there from 2010 to 2013, which was during the very early years of the LIBOR investigation before these folks were charged. But uh, it was a really difficult uh, exercise in coordination between the U.S. authorities and the U.K. authorities once the Serious Fraud Office started to investigate because they operate under very different rules. There's no Fifth Amendment protection. And, uh, and in fact, there were other cases here in the U.S. that ended up getting overturned because of what the Serious Fraud Office had done in questioning witnesses under compulsion, which is the term in the U.K., um, which you would not have been allowed to do in uh, the U.S. And so the Allen case uh, reversed some convictions uh, in the LIBOR matter because of uh, violations of the Fifth Amendment under U.S. law. So, and then that is also, um, that came up again in, in the article that you were reading from about David Zinn's interview yeah. of Rob Zink, where, you know, the employment laws in the U.K. are, are very different. And David Zinn and I are in a case together now where there's some uh, issues, some witnesses in the U.K., and we're not sure that the company could fire the employees for refusing to cooperate with the investigation the way that you could here in the U.S. And so how DOJ is going to view that, we don't really know. Um, but it's very interesting when you have these uh, cross-border investigations and authorities in two different countries where the systems conflict and cause problems for later prosecutions. Um, that wasn't specifically an issue in Connolly, but I can just read between the lines at how difficult it was to uh, interview employees uh, under, you know, U.S. law and U.K. law in a way that would satisfy the regimes in both countries. So. You know, you know, query if, if uh, you know, does a corporation want to have an ironclad policy in place that if you don't cooperate in an internal investigation, whenever we want you to and completely, we are going to fire you. Do they want to have that kind of black letter rule within the corporation or not? Because mm -hmm. uh, that gives them some leeway. And, and secondly, um, particularly because of the Yates uh, memo, uh, if, if, if to the extent that, that there's a perception that it's changed practice, uh, do, you, do you start getting, should competent general counsel uh, start getting lawyers for individuals who are in the flight path of the investigation from the outset before they start investigating them and give them a reasonable opportunity to review documents and other things before mm -hmm. they are interviewed mm -hmm. by outside counsel? Mm -hmm. I've uh, joined a case a couple years ago where I was uh, on the phone with another defense counsel. Um, right as I got into the case and I hadn't even met my clients yet and so I, I said to her I said I you know I haven't met the clients yet I'm going to go meet them you know next week and talk to them and then you know we'll find out if it's in their interest uh, you know to be interviewed by a uh, company counsel and she said what you know, you're not going to have a choice on that and I thought well really you know it but uh, she said oh the company's not going to like that and you know, my instinct was, well, I want to do what's in my employee's best interest and my client's best interest, regardless of what the company's going to do. Um, and it turned out that uh, they didn't have the issues that, you know, would have prevented them from interviewing. And uh, that was perfectly consistent with their interests. But I haven't faced that question where I really thought it was not in the employee's interest to talk to company counsel. I don't know if any of you all have had that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, there's a binary choice, you know, lose your right. job or lose your freedom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's. Uh, but I, I think, you know, the interesting issue to me in terms of do you provide counsel, I'm assuming the corporation can afford it, uh, do you provide counsel for people in this setting early? Uh, and, you know, obviously if you've got a contractual obligation, 
uh, you do if you've got to, you know, to indemnify them and give them access to counsel, et cetera. If you've got statutory obligations, you do. Uh, but the general counsels that I found that were the most enlightened were ones who thought and said to the government, uh, I think it's an implied condition of employment at this bank or whatever uh, that I'm going to get counsel for somebody uh, who is in the flight path of a serious complex transaction or set of transactions uh, that regulators and prosecutors are looking into. Uh, I think that's the only fair thing to do for the employees and regardless of whether or not I've got uh, any formal obligation to give them counsel, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to tell the government, uh, basically, if they don't like that, I don't care yeah. uh, because I think that's my obligation to the company and to everybody uh, because, there, you know, there's an impact here. It's not just the shareholders. I mean, the shareholders are obviously impacted by uh, any kind of misconduct within the corporation. But if you don't treat the employees fairly uh, and you, you know, you jump on them or you ambush them, et cetera, who's going to want to come work mm -hmm. for the company? Mm -hmm. What's the morale going to be like within the company? You know, after the fact, when others learn uh, that their counter, you know, their their uh, their colleagues, etc., were not treated fairly. Right. I mean, this has very serious mm -hmm. financial consequences in a lot of different directions. Now, the department's really not supposed to hold it against the company for of providing counsel to employees. But have you ever seen that or felt that that there was some resistance to uh, providing counsel because that might interfere with the uh, the government's uh, desire to have the employees fess up before they are represented. Yeah, I mean, you know, God invented the Fifth Amendment for a reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've seen cases where the government is asking folks in interviews, um, you know, are you represented by counsel and, and who's paying for that lawyer? Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't think that's an appropriate question for them to be asking. I mean, who cares who's paying for him? He's entitled to a lawyer. He got a lawyer. It really doesn't matter who's paying for it. And the fact that they're asking the question suggests that they think it's improper. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, it, that, that happens. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to companies. I understand how it might be viewed, uh, you know, negatively by the government if you get lawyers for, for employees. But it is the right thing to do. As I said, I, I think that if somebody you know is in the crosshairs, you know, it, it, it just doesn't seem right to me that the company should be just throwing these people uh, to the wolves in order to save itself. And one of the postscripts to that Connolly decision is, in addition to not taking a shot at um, the law firm, uh, it, in fact, she praised the law firm for the great result she got for the company. But the company's result was, you know, a DPA paid a bunch of money, it didn't get prosecuted, and the way it did is by throwing these other two guys under the bus. Yep, for sure. I'm happy to see there's some participation from the audience. Is there a question right here? Yep, right in front, and then I'll get to you in the back. Thank you. Yes. Isn't there fundamental problem here is that the government is getting companies the corporate counsel to do the one thing that a, the government cannot do and that is fire somebody. If a federal agent comes up to yeah. someone and says, I want, I want to interview you, they can say no. Yeah. If they get a grand jury subpoena, they can assert their fifth amendment. And the way that the government whether it be the Yates memo, the Rosenstein memo, any of the memos that are present, is to say we will pay the company for this work by giving the company more cooperation credit. So the government is essentially buying something that it can never get on its own, and that is the employee's job. Yeah. Where they don't have a choice. Yeah. Could people hear this comment? Uh, um, many, most. It sounds like everybody could. Then, yeah. I mean, that's true. I think that. Uh, I, I, you know, Tom and I talked about this last night, and I, and I, I agree with that perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that, uh, you know, there's something untoward about it. Uh, it doesn't strike me as right. Uh, it goes back. You know, I, I was federal prosecutor for the last 10 or 11 years. Before that, I was in private practice. Um, one of the cases, and I worked on as an associate, was the Enron Barge case involving Merrill Lynch. And I think back as a young associate to that experience even today, where it was very similar. Uh, you know, a bunch of employees associated with Merrill Lynch get thrown to the wolves. Um, Merrill Lynch walks away paying some money, and that's the end of that. Um, these guys have to go to trial. Some of them go to jail, and then ultimately the whole case gets reversed. Uh, none of the convictions stood, but it was all sort of driven by this 
you know, company throwing employees under the bus. And I just think, I mean, obviously it's been, it's been a policy for a long time. I mean, I think people understood that this was the way things happen sometimes. But I think what happened with Yates is it kind of became, you know, all or nothing. Either you do that or you're not getting any cooperation from us. In, in the back, and then I'll come back to you. Yes, yeah, come back. Come on. No, no, they were told. I mean, Kevin Black was not interviewed voluntarily. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, voluntarily. I mean, he was told he'd get fired. Where I was going? No, no, that's what I meant. There are companies that actually have a water policy that don't allow them to get a lawyer. Yeah. 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 That, that the opinion reflects that. I don't have any. I think it was. I think there was a hearing. A hearing about uh, during the hearing. You know, the judge had the trial. The, this issue was raised. I think pre-trial, mid-trial, yeah. yeah. and then she conducted a hearing post-trial because I think she was so troubled by it. Um, she had a hearing where she called the lawyer as a witness and then issued this opinion, which was just blasted the government. So, so my, my point being is that we, if we're doing an internal investigation, may wind up being the witness trial. Because how else? You mean you're not, we're not going to pay for you to have a lawyer, or you can't go hire your own lawyer, or you can't have them present during the interview? I'm not sure I understand the question. Have them present during the interview? Yeah, well, I mean, you got that, that's a, I've, I've seen that policy too, and that's a difficult choice for the individual to make. Uh, but if he's going to make that decision, or she's going to make that decision, they ought to make it with the advice of counsel before they do that. But I mean, obviously, and uh, you know, you, you got to be prepared for that meeting if you're not going to have your counsel there. I have found, you know, more enlightened GCs will allow me to be present during the interview of the client, but really don't want me to participate uh, in it, hmm. but will allow me to be there. Let me yes, get sir, your I'm question sorry. before we go to the back. She has, yep, Sean. Uh, <laughs> I went down a lot of rabbit holes in this conversation. Um, it's been great. This leads me to question going down a rabbit hole. Is, okay, so now we're in a situation where ethically, I agree, you should be enhanced a strong warning warn them, like, hey, you might want a lawyer, this can all happen. Now they don't want to talk. So now the companies can't complete their investigation because the main people they need to talk won't talk to them, probably rightly so. Then the company has to go to the DOJ and say, we couldn't disclose everything, we couldn't do a complete investigation because of this is these employees who would talk to us, probably rightly so. So, like, where do you guys see that going in terms of whether or not the government would say, well, yes, the company has done the best that they could, we try to be cooperative with us, and whether or not they're going to go after their employees who may be at this point exercising about this and anything like that? Well, I mean, I guess my first instinct would be that your obligation as a lawyer, first and foremost, is to operate ethically, uh, regardless of what those consequences are. Uh, that's your job as a lawyer, basically. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I mean, are there ways around this? Uh, maybe potentially, uh, if, if the company is willing to do it. Uh, you know, if the employee says, well, I'd be delighted to tell, you know, I mean, obviously the company wants to get to the bottom of what the problem is. Forget the government. To fix the problem. Um, and that's, you know, that's internally, that's what you want to do, regardless of the government involvement, etc. If there's if there's misconduct going on in my corporation, I want to stop it and I want to put an end to it now, whether we get prosecuted or not, or whether anyone gets prosecuted. So what if the you know if the uh, if the employee says, guess what, you know, company counsel, uh, you all enter into a uh, you know, I know you want the information. I want to give you the information, but I don't want you to give it to the government without my consent. So enter into a joint defense agreement with me where I control the further dissemination of the information, not you. Uh, you know, is it possible to do that? Some people, some companies might agree to that, mm -hmm. uh, to get the facts and get the information, but... but Hank, do you mean without attribution? Beg your pardon? Do you mean, do you mean without attribution to who told them the information? So like, 
in your situation, if there's a joint yeah. defense agreement, you, they get the information, they can tell the government this is what was going on, but I'm not going to tell you who told me this. Right. Without attribution, yeah. Is the government going to give the company credit for that? Well, th there's a clause in this Yates memo within the bounds of law and legal privilege. So mm -hmm. I think what you want to do is just mm -hmm. add to that that my ethical guidelines mm -hmm. are tantamount to law or legal privileges. And my ethical guidelines require me to give enhanced upjohn warnings. So that's what I'm going to do. She makes it pretty clear they're not going to punish you for I think where it does get dicey, she says facts aren't privileged, and then you get back to, well, that's not what Rod wants. Rod doesn't want facts. He wants people who are significantly involved, responsible, authorized the misconduct. That's a conclusion. That's an observation. So Rod is asking for more than just the facts. Is that privileged? Um, and I'm hoping yeah, these well, I mean, I mean, I think you push. <laughs> no, I think you, I think you push back to begin with. Uh, at like, DOJ, you've created this problem. There is an inherent conflict of interest because of the Yates Memorandum here, in terms of you know the law, uh, the outside lawyers and the corporation against the employees. There's an inherent conflict of interest, which here. could be solved if you narrowed your definition of cooperation. Right. Agreed? Yeah. Because people cooperate in all kinds of criminal cases. So what does it mean to cooperate? Is it just what is known now and within your power to share, or is there some duty to investigate further? Well, I, I, Rosenstein's comments, you know, what he said is that he expects these companies to, to work in good faith to help the government and in, in connection with these investigations. Um, I think if in good faith you feel compelled to provide these enhanced warnings, because you feel like this person may well have liability, I think the government would be hard pressed to say that you're not operating in good faith. You're fulfilling your ethical obligations, you're working in good faith to try and help them, but at the same time, you, you have to abide by your ethical sense of what's right and what's wrong. And if an employee is in jeopardy, you've got to tell them. Joe, let me give you chair's prerogative here. <laughs> well, as I think about this, I, I saw Sally the day after she issued the H memo, and uh, just with a group of defense uh, attorneys meeting with her and, and the, uh, with the U.S. Attorney General and her. And so uh, we learned that there's been a big announcement about the Yates memo. And one of, the, one of the things I thought at the time was it would have been great had there been an opportunity for us to meet with her the day previous <laughs> memo, for us to have an opportunity to hear what she was about to issue. Because what happens is you have something being issued by prosecuting attorneys uh, without the benefit of appreciating the challenges, the swings and arrows of the right. defendant people. And I know that Sally and y'all appreciate and love Sally, right? Yeah. We do. <laughs> but as a practical matter, uh, she's never spent much more than four weeks of time at Kingdom Spalding in previous that mm -hmm. she was an associate there for most of her career has been as a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know that, and, and despite the fact that she had all the wonderful people at DOJ helping her with a memo, I don't think there was a single period uh, comma of that entire document that had any involvement from the defense bar. And it would have been a useful exercise to have that discussion. Although... I would suggest the clock needs to be reset, and there needs to be separate dialogue that would occur with the ADA and others. And not only Rod, Ros Rod Rosenstein tried to work with a foul deer a bit, and how do you move that to still first? And I don't know that it could be a time. Well, I, I um, Sally can hire a lot better lawyer than me, but I, I do. And Joe, of course you're right, because you invited me to be on the panel. So <laughs> let, me, let me agree with you up front. But also, it, it, it is difficult. I've seen Sally, I've seen A.G. Holder, I've seen A.G. Sessions, I've seen Jim Cole, and they, if you want to create bipartisanship in Congress, have both sides attacking the Department of Justice because there's not a single individual who's gone to jail for any major white-collar scandal. Mm -hmm. And when they come for oversight hearings, particularly in the context of criminal justice reform, uh, you're sending whole categories of people to jail for this offense, and no one goes to jail for that. So I do get their 
emphasis on individuals, I think not just Sally, but also Rod in, in a weird way creates, un I don't think he intended his comments to be read the way they possibly could be read. It's a tough needle to thread. Hank said this yesterday, and one of the th com commentaries I've read about the AIDS memo and, and solutions to it is, is something that Hank said, which is the government should get back to doing its own investigations. Uh, you know, that would avoid some of these problems if the government actually had agents that were willing and interested to go dig into boxes of records uh, to do the kinds of investigations that they're very capable of doing. Uh, you know, I mean, as the criminal chief over the last nine years in Savannah, I mean, I saw that, you know, over time, uh, more and more agents wanted, you know, watch TV, it seemed, and wanted to be the guys that, you know, had the M MP3 in the trunk of the car and responded to bank robberies and did all this violent crime stuff um, and were less interested in, in you know, the, the mundane task of spending days and days and days going through boxes to develop uh, a white collar case. And I don't know how much that is a part of this, but I, I wonder if it is. Oh, you were the criminal chief, right? Yep. So we incent cooperation in every other facet of crime. H how do you incent cooperation in white collar crime uh, in a way other than what the, the DAGs and the AGs have tried to do with their memos? H how do you incent people to, and we reward people for, for ratting out all kinds of folks. I, I think that you know all of the criticism of the AIDS memo has been that it's the all or nothing approach right. that it, it, it took. I mean, you know, we all understand, and Tom and I talked, Tom Beaver and I talked about this last night. It's, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's always been the practice. Everybody sort of understood that at some point a company may well decide to save itself at the expense of, of an employee, but it's, it has never been the all or nothing in order to get credit that's now required uh, in order to, to get cooperation credit that's sort of required under, under Yates. So I think that it can be accomplished, but I, the best way to accomplish it is what Hank said, which is go get the agents to do the investigation. Did I miss a question in the back or did we, we, don't worry about it, we passed through that. So, well, we have about 10 more minutes, so maybe I can get a closing thought from each of you and then let the uh, chairs close out the conference. And thank you for having such a lively uh, uh, audience on this last, panel. We really appreciate it. Well, my, my closing thought is what, what I've, you know, I've said throughout this presentation. I really do think that uh, there is a need for enhanced upjohn warnings in these internal investigations. I think folks need to be told. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. Um, I'm not saying that simply because I'm now on the defense side and I was a prosecutor for the last 10 years. As a prosecutor, I tried to be fair there too. I, I took what I thought was a fair position on most cases. Uh, and I just think it's only fair and ethical for the employees to know that these companies, um, you know, may well turn over everything they say in order to save themselves. And in fact, they may have already waived the privilege and may have already done some of that all, um, even before the interview happened. Just the government has awesome powers, awesome responsibilities. We give them resources that we don't give anyone else. And it is, um, as a former prosecutor, disheartening to see the outsourcing of, mm -hmm. of those uh, responsibilities and powers to someone else. I think we do need to kind of center around a definition of cooperation that we can all live with. It is shy of everything um, to receive some credit. Um, and to my friend on the second row, between um, ethics and uh, and a DOJ memo, I would I would rather err on the side of ethics and what I thought was right. Um, I, I guess my final comment is that. Uh, yeah, you know, folks should man up or woman up here uh, and do the right thing, uh, basically, and don't just be a high-paid paralegal for DOJ. All right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joe and Brian. Thanks. Great job. Very fun.